Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Roboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God's. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. John 20, verse 1. So what we read, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Our gospel text this morning begins with Mary going to a tomb, going to a grave. It's still dark outside on that first day of the week. And in Jewish thinking, each new day begins in darkness. The new day does not begin with being able to see. The new day begins with being unable to see. Newness is born into nothingness. New life, it appears, starts in the dark. But on the first Sunday of the resurrection, we could scarcely perceive this. Certainly Mary Magdalene did not yet know what had broken out of the grave. Well, Mary was at the grave. Mark's gospel will tell us that Mary was going to anoint Jesus' body with spices and perfume. Jesus had been hastily buried by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus because the Sabbath was fast approaching at the hour of his death. And so they hurriedly wrapped his body and placed it in an unused tomb. And likely Mary wanted to come and offer her own contribution, her spices and her perfumes. This is much like how you and I might go to a graveside and bring flowers to pay respects to the dead. That's what Mary was doing on the first Easter. Well, Mary arrives at the tomb and she finds that the stone has been rolled away she assumes the worst. Someone has taken the body of her Lord. And so Mary runs and tells Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved, 
which is John. Peter and John have a race. They gun it straight to Jesus' tomb. And because John is hilarious, he tells us that, by the way, he won the race, just so you know. Peter the Rock, also now known as Peter the first place loser (laughs) in the Easter morning marathon. Like, he has to mention it a couple times. Out of all things you could say about Jesus rising from the dead. By the way, I won the race, everyone. Like, love it. Just love it. Thanks, John. (laughs) Well, they they get to the tomb, and they find strips of linen. They find the cloth that was wrapped around Jesus' head. And both of these are just folded neatly in the tomb. The tombs around Jerusalem would have been uh, carved out from the rock, and there would be this platform, and so you would just imagine two pieces of clothing there. But Peter and John, they don't actually understand what they're seeing. They're unsure of what to make of this empty tomb, and so they go back to the place that they were staying. But Mary doesn't. Mary Magdalene does not leave Jesus' empty tomb. Instead, she stands outside the tomb weeping. Verse 11, Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Mary gets to see something that Peter and John did not see. Two angels. And the angels will ask her why she's crying. And then for some odd reason, we don't hear from these angels again. But I think it's important, just before we rush off to the next part of the story, to just pause here. Because this gives us a window into what the Gospel of John is trying to tell us. See, the angels here in John's Gospel, unlike the other Gospels, they don't loudly announce the good news of an empty tomb. They don't say, he is risen, like they do in the other Gospels. No, these angels that Mary sees are a lot more subtle because they instead chose to demonstrate the good news of the empty tomb. Let me tell you what I mean. You see, anyone from a Jewish background would have already understood what the angels were saying. John's gospel tells us that the angels were seated, one at the head and the other at the foot. There would have been a slab of stone cut out in between them. Well, that's a reference to a symbol in the Old Testament called the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was this gold-covered wooden box that God had Moses build and placed in the Holy of Holies. And on the lid of the Ark, you would see two angels, one at the head and the other at the foot. They would be facing each other. And that lid, very importantly, was called the mercy seat. It's where the high priest every year would receive mercy and forgiveness of sins for the people on the Day of Atonement. Every year, in Jewish thinking, this was an important declaration of forgiveness. So what is John telling us? Well, he's telling us that mercy and forgiveness of sins have burst out of the tomb. Now, Mary doesn't yet perceive this. She's still in tears, and again, the the angels, they go MIA. They just disappear. It's weird. And perhaps they disappear because the answer to her sorrow is about to speak to her face to face. So in verse 14, at this, she, Mary, turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. Jesus asked Mary the same question that the angels asked her. Woman, why are you crying? Mary doesn't know it's Jesus. She supposed him to be the gardener. And so maybe thinking that the gardener knows some more details, she asks him, 
Sir, if you have carried Jesus away, tell me where you've put him. I will go get him. Like Mary is so determined to find Jesus. And then, in a holy moment, Jesus says her name. Mary. Well, her eyes are opened, and she sees the Lord, and she exclaims, Rabboni! Mary's mourning turns to dancing. Her sorrow is turned to joy. She sees that he is risen. Mary is the first person in the Gospels to see the risen Lord. And at first, Mary thinks Jesus is a gardener. A logical mistake or a prophetic mistake, or perhaps even not a mistake at all. Now, this may seem like incidental information to us, but again, the Gospel of John is giving his readers a subtle hint at the profound meaning of resurrection. Gary Burge, in his commentary on John, will put it like this. He says, John is consciously sweeping up numerous biblical motifs that connect with the theme of garden. It is no accident that here in the garden, Mary misunderstands the identity of Jesus and thinks he's a gardener. So what is John telling us about the garden? What is John saying here? Well, to understand this, we need to begin at the beginning. And in the story that the Bible tells us, the beginning is the book of Genesis. There we read in the first verse, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John knows this. In fact, when John starts his gospel, he'll write, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. It seems that John really, really, really likes giving references to the book of Genesis. And in our passage today, It's no different. John reminds us that we're in a garden. And so John, in hinting at the garden, is already cluing us in about the first garden, the Garden of Eden. Humankind was formed in this garden, placed in this garden. We were God's image bearers. We are God's image bearers in creation. Adam would be given a task to work the garden and take care of it. Or in other words, Adam's first job was to be a gardener. And it's in the Garden of Eden that Eve will be tempted by the serpent. She will be deceived and Adam will soon follow. They will realize their nakedness. They become afraid and they hide from God. And as a result of this, thorns and thistles grow up from the ground because of their actions. All of creation is never the same again because the virus and sickness of death was released that day. Humanity has left the garden, gone east of Eden into the desolation of the grave. But hope is not lost. No, it's from that garden that God will say to the serpent, and I will put enmity between you and the woman Between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Right here, the first thing that God says in response to the fall is that he will be faithful. That God will bring us back to paradise. Back to the garden. We see this theme of garden just showing up all over the place in the Bible. But most notably, this theme shows up in the book of Isaiah. There, the prophet Isaiah will actually call the people of Israel a garden, a vineyard. Chapter 5, verse 1, Isaiah writes, I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard, his garden. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. This is the problem with the people of Israel, with all of us. We yield bad fruit. 
And so always the result is the breakdown of the garden. Just a few verses later, Isaiah will say, Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, its protection, uh, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned or cultivated. And the briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The garden is given over to the briars and thorns. The garden is lost for Isaiah. This will be the way that the prophet Isaiah will convey the reality of sin and brokenness and what it causes. But this is not the whole story. So Isaiah prophetically imagines multiple images of the way God would send a servant to bring us back to the garden. God calls this, God through the prophet Isaiah will call this person Emmanuel, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. This servant of the Lord would be despised and rejected by humankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. He would be pierced by our transgressions, crushed by our iniquities. And because of what this servant of the Lord would do, Isaiah can imagine a day when all of us would return to the Lord, where mercy and forgiveness, grace and peace are made freely available to all. And so Isaiah gets another dream 50 chapters later, and he opens up that chapter by saying, Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. You who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money, without cost. I just bought milk for like eight bucks the other day before, <laughs> before the big storm. I would like to buy milk without cost. That would be great. <laughs> Wine too, but that's another story. <laughs> well, the results of what, what happened at, when we return to the Lord, Isaiah imagines the garden again. Just a few verses later, Isaiah will again remember that garden from 50 chapters ago, and he will write, Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper. Instead of the briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. The story that the Bible is telling is a story of our return back to the garden. Jesus has come to bring us back to the garden. He has come to make our graves gardens again. And so as we return now to Mary in the garden tomb, Mary, assuming that Jesus is a gardener, was wrong at one level. And yet if we catch the gospel of John's hint at another level, Mary is deeply, deeply right. Jesus is the gardener of a new creation. Friends, the garden and the gardener have returned. King Jesus is risen from the dead. While the first Adam was a gardener who failed in his task and the world became a wasteland of war and sin, the second Adam will succeed in his task. He will restore the ruined garden. With Christ as the gardener of a new creation, you and I have hope because he is risen. Hmm. My wife Kaylee loves plants. And one of her hobbies that she picked up in COVID was a bit of a gardening, a bit of a green thumb. And so I've watched her these last couple of years with all the plants she keeps bringing home to our house. (laughs) And I've learned from her The gardening is actually slow, patient work. You have to get your hands in the dirt. You have to pull a few weeds. You need just the right amount of sunlight and water. Sometimes you have to transplant a whole plant into a new pot. Gardening is hard work. But the results are so beautiful. So I want to say to you today, that Jesus wants to begin the patient work of tending to your parched soul. 
Jesus, the true gardener, has come to uproot thorns and thistles in your life. He wants you to thrive. He wants you to live life abundantly. Jesus has come to turn every grave into a garden. And so today, are you thirsty? Then come to the water. You who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without cost. Today, Jesus invites you to trust him with the care of your life. You can trust him today. It's never too late. He wants to transform your life into a garden. Amen.